going to talk now about short and long-term goals in church planting. Sometimes people ask, well, when is a church plant considered planted and no longer a church plant? And so we might consider a short-term goal as uh, some of the basic things we want to see achieved when we could say that church is planted. And if there was a missionary church planter or itinerant church planter, that person would then move on. Um, well, if we look at the Apostle Paul, we see again that there wasn't a lot that had to be in place. There were people that were reached from the community, new believers, they were coming together, they were meeting regularly, as we said, for biblical purposes, and the key was those first leaders were installed. And so we find that uh, Paul and Barnabas, for example, on that first missionary trip, they uh, had evangelized places like Lystra and Iconium and so on and Derby. Well, they went back in Acts chapter 14 and installed elders in those churches. And it says there that they commended them to the Lord. In other words, the pioneering church planting aspect in one sense had been completed and Paul and Barnabas moved on and uh, eventually pioneered other areas. So we might say short-term goals are reaching the local people. Uh, they've been basically discipled. They have uh, in internalized biblical values. And there are spiritual leaders who are local leaders who are going to stay there after the church planter leaves. But there are also what we call waterers. Remember in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul said, I planted, but Apollos watered. And so Paul was sort of the pioneer. So he, he did the initial planting like a, a tree, but then there were others who came along, like Apollos, who was more of a teacher. And he watered. The church in Corinth, as you know, was not a very healthy church. And so there was a need for others to come in to keep teaching, to correct some of the problems. And so you have planters who are more the pioneers, waters who, who strengthen. So we could say a short-term goal would be what the planter does. But we also want to talk about long-term goals. We don't just want to plant an individual church. As we said, we want healthy churches. We want reproducing churches. We want churches that are taking the mission of God forward. And so those would be longer term goals, that they're healthy, reproducing, they're interdependent. In other words, the churches Paul planted, he brought them into contact with other churches. Um, with the Jerusalem church, for example. Uh, the Jerusalem church had teaching uh, from Acts 15 that was communicated to the churches. Uh, the churches that were planted took up offerings for the famine in Jerusalem. So the churches were interrelated, they helped one another. We also find Paul constantly taking workers from one church and sending them to another church. We see in the letters and the scriptures that there's greetings going back and forth. So these churches were not totally independent on their own, but they were relating to one another. And that's important, especially if we want to create a sense of movement. We sometimes talk about the three self-definition of indigenous churches that they're self-propagating. In other words, a church is now evangelizing on its own. It doesn't take an outside missionary. They're leading people to Christ. Uh, the church is self-supporting. It's financially able to cover its own needs. Uh, the funds that were used to start that church can now go and start something else. They have, they're self-governing. Uh, In other words, the leaders are local leaders. There's not outsiders telling them what they have to do, but they're local believers that have grown and now have leadership. And then sometimes we add what's called a fourth self, which is called self-theologizing, which means these believers can read the Bible for themselves. They, they're going to be facing challenges, and they don't always have to look to an outsider, a missionary, or somebody else to be uh, telling them what to do, but they can read and apply the scriptures themselves, and they can face the challenges uh, that they're facing. And uh, this doesn't mean an outside missionary or other people couldn't help, but they're mature in their word and their use of the word of God. So these would be longer term goals that we would be looking for. Now, let's talk about the contexts of church planting. By this, I'm not talking about a specific cultural context, but I'm talking about different kinds of situations in which churches are planted. One would be pioneer church planting. Well, this would be where you go into an area where there simply are no churches at all. We might think of certain places in, in Central Asia, countries where there really are no Christians. Uh, and so the missionary, the church planter goes in, and that person's going to have to win the very first people to Christ. There might be a team of people that go in, 
But this would be ultimate pioneer church planning, starting from zero. There's no other believers there. There's nothing to start with. This is, of course, what Paul was doing in most of his ministry. He said, I don't want to build on somebody else's foundation. I want to go where Christ is not known. That would be sort of your ultimate pioneer church planting. And there's still a lot of places in the world today, we call them unreached people, that need pioneer church planting. And that takes a special kind of church planter who can adapt to that culture, who can maybe even learn another language, who can learn how to communicate in a way that really speaks to the heart of those people and can bring them together. It's a big, big challenge. Another type of context would be what's called replacement church planting. And this would be planting a church in a place where maybe there used to be Christians, but there are not any longer. We think of Turkey. You know, those churches that Paul planted in Asia Minor and Ephesus and Smyrna and Philadelphia and all those churches there, that today is Turkey. And of course, as you know, Turkey is a predominantly Muslim country today. And all those cities where Paul once had planted those churches that were vibrant, healthy churches, for the most part, those churches don't exist. And so we would call that replacement church planning, going in, re-evangelizing the same region. And then there's what could be called sectarian church planting. Uh, this has a little bit of a negative ring to it. It's when a particular denomination, whether that's Baptist or Presbyterian, Methodist, whatever their name is, they say, well, you know, there's other churches here, but there's no churches like our church. And so they want to see their particular denomination planted in that area. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. We sometimes think, well, that is going to create competition. Now, it could create competition if they're trying to steal sheep, as we say, from another church. But if that new group goes in, they're going to reach new people that the other churches are probably not reaching. And because of their denominational distinctive, they're probably going to have a style that speaks and, and ministers to some people more than others. So they may be more Pentecostal and more expressive, and that, that just is something that some people resonate with more. Or they may be a more liturgical, and that's something that other people can relate to more. And so sectarian church planning is not necessarily a bad thing, as long as they're not splitting other churches, as long as they're not stealing members from other churches, but they're reaching new people for Christ. Saturation church planting will be planting churches in places where there are already some churches, but not enough churches. Of course, that raises the question, how many churches are enough churches? How, how many churches does a city need? Um, I was a church planter in the city of Munich. We did, uh, this was in the early 1990s, and we did a study of the city. We said, how many churches are gospel preaching, Bible believing churches? in this city. In the city proper, there's about 1.3 million, maybe another uh, half million or so in, in the surrounding suburbs. And um, we found out that to have the goal of even one church for every 10,000 people in the city, we had to plant about 100 churches. That would be just to reach a ratio of 1 to 10,000. Now, some organizations like uh, Dawn, they say the goal should be one church per 1,000 people. And you might be thinking where you live, uh, that's a lot of churches. But think about it for a minute. Why do they come to that ratio of one church per 1,000 people? Well, they figure if every church had 100 members and each member had 10 people that were their friends, they could reach a thousand people. Another way to look at saturation church planning is to say, let's look at all the churches in the city. How many seats, just how many chairs are there if we added up all the chairs in all those churches? And you might find, well, there's 7,000 seats, but our city has 100,000 people. So even if every one of those churches were totally full every Sunday, and maybe they had two services every single Sunday, we would still not have the capacity to reach everybody in this city. So there have been organizations that have been promoting saturation church planting. So it's not a wrong thing to go and plant churches in cities where there are other churches. It's really a question of how many churches. TBS Seminary 
is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Now, that does raise the question um, about how do you relate to other churches? Because many of us are going to be planning churches in a city or a community where there is another church. When is that really legitimate? And I give these recommendations. First of all, honestly evaluate the spiritual needs of the community. There actually are some communities that have a lot of churches, a lot of different kinds of churches, and are doing a good job. Maybe that's not the best place to plant a new church. Maybe you should go to another community in another city. And so you consider how many churches are really needed. You also consider the question of nominalism. I mentioned this before. Maybe you're working in a place where everybody says, I'm Lutheran or I'm Roman Catholic or I'm Orthodox. But you know that on any given Sunday, there's maybe only 5% of the people that are really attending church. In other words, they call themselves Christian, but they're really not practicing. They don't necessarily have a living relationship to Christ. And I think in those places, we have a right to say, we will reach those people who are not followers of Christ. I believe it is appropriate to inform other churches. Now again, you'll have to know about your context how this works. But my practice has been in Germany where we were church planters in, in largely Roman Catholic part of the country. I would go and try and talk to the local priest or a local pastor and at least tell them that we were there, why we were there, what we were doing, just in fairness to the others. Now sometimes that will mean they will can create trouble for you. <laughs> um, and uh, Or in a very, very large city, you may say, uh, you know, that's you know, there's so many groups here that's not necessary. You'll have to discern that. I always felt it was a good thing to do, um, even though it was not always very comfortable, and sometimes they would ask you very difficult questions. But um, I always did that. And uh, the other thing is I usually, I uh, would promise other churches, if they were Bible teaching churches, we will not steal your members. If anybody comes to my church that has been an active part of your church, I will inform the leadership or the pastor of that church and say, you know, a certain person started coming to my church that's from your church. Um, is there a problem there? Sometimes you'll get problem people who are leaving another church because they're a problem. And it's good to know about that. And I've actually been in a situation where I've sent people back to their home church and said, you know what, I have promised I'm not going to steal members from other churches, so I want you to go back to your home church. We really, you serve God there and um, but we want to reach new people for Christ. I've actually done that. Uh, that creates goodwill. And you know what? I've found that cooperating with other churches, sometimes when you're the new church plant in town, others look at you and go, what are you doing here? You know, we, we've, we, we have a hard enough time reaching people. We don't need you. You're going to be competition and so on. That, that's not unusual. But uh, I've found that if you show goodwill and um, you try to cooperate with the other churches, uh, i found usually that they will... Uh, reciprocate and sometimes you can have projects that you do together. So those are just a few words about planting churches where other churches already exist.